British Parliament was totally united in supporting the Allies in the Gulf War. Once again, this small nation found itself taking a leading role in world affairs far beyond its size and economic importance. But everyone seems to have forgotten the men who, 30 years ago, took the risks which ensured Britain's place as a leader in world politics. The servicemen from Britain, Australia and New Zealand who built the air bases and witnessed the explosions of the first British nuclear bomb tests. These men have always claimed that their cancers could be traced to participation in those tests. Tonight's dispatch uncovers the evidence that could at last clinch their case. With secret film of the actual tests never before seen, Dispatches presents for the first time the truth of Christmas Island. Christmas Island swelters in 90 degrees of heat every day of the year. There, 1,500 islanders exist on fish and coconuts thousands of miles from anywhere in the middle of the Pacific. But Ken McGinley has traveled from Scotland halfway across the world to see the island again. He has many ghosts to lay. I was medically discharged in 1959, and it was about April time, and I hadn't been keeping too well. So I went to see my doctor and he says to me, I am going to send you up to the military hospital, he said, because you will always regret the day that you went to Christmas Island. I don't know my life expectancy. Uh, it could be tomorrow. A teaching hospital in London discovered that it was a very rare form of leukemia. You know, got my spleen, that's the way. Who knows? Walter worked to the stevedores on clearing up operations after the explosions. Yeah. 1983, he started various aches and pains. And then they discovered he had uh, multiple myeloma. These left collarbone broke. Uh, they put a plate in that one, then his leg fractured. They put pins, cement and a plate in that one. Next operation was his left arm, from his elbow to his shoulder. He had three pins put in that one. Then his right shoulder, he had an artificial joint. Uh, then his right knee, he had an artificial knee. They never accepted it would beat him, but so it did. It was a most amazing sight because it was brilliant. It was all shimmering ice crystals of all, all different colours. And he said it was simply beautiful. The sole purpose of his being on the island was just to see the explosion. And after they'd flown around the site a couple of times, they were taken off again. Myelitis which is cancer of the bone marrow, must have got going about six years before his death. A rather mysterious illness, which destroys the immunity in the blood. I mean, he just had to have a little scratch and it would go septic. 1970, I lost every hair in the body. All my hair dropped out. Eyebrows, eyelashes. Uh, teeth, 
dropped out. The body was covered in a rash. Uh, toenails have dropped out. Uh, I'm now developing cataracts. I've got very high blood pressure. Continuously sick. And to this day, I put it down to that detonation of that H bomb in April 1958. The government's view is that there is no evidence, either medical or scientific, to link participation in the nuclear weapons test program and the ill health which some of the participants have subsequently suffered. This debate in March 1990 showed that the British government had not changed its view in 30 years, but the leukaemia rates of the British and New Zealand servicemen are over five times what they should be. They'll be proved liars because they keep saying there was nothing wrong. And the, the statistics now building up so much that they're going, they're going to feel ashamed when the truth is known because we're all dying. Now, as far as the test program are concerned, they were drawn up and implemented with professional thoroughness, and they do bear favorable comparison with the standards that are in force today. There is a lot of evidence of the importance attached at the time to the safety of those who took part. It is interesting to record that no one suffered by contamination and that no single item of equipment sustained unforeseen effects. This film of the grapple tests has never been seen publicly before. It was produced by a Ministry of Defence film crew which covered every detail of the operation and was for armed forces eyes only. The Ministry of Defence says it no longer exists. It shows men in protective clothing and says they were issued with radiation badges, though none are shown. It tells the soldiers that the tests were quite safe. But when they were first planned, total safety was certainly not the intention. These secret documents were produced by military advisors in 1953 to tell the government what the nuclear test should be used to find out. This report from May the 20th says, The Army must discover the detailed effects of explosion on equipment, stores and men, with and without various types of protection. And just two months later, this document was drawn up by the chief medical officer. It lists the data required for the military planning of tests, and it says they must show the effects of beta burn radiation from direct fallout on troops and from fission products on the ground in highly contaminated areas. That's what a weapon's about. How much uh, capacity does it have to put out? Uh not simply real estate, but put out armies in the field. Remember, at this time again, the uh, uh, application of nuclear weapons was moving towards the field application. That is not bombing cities, but bombing battlefields. In the 1950s, the principal advisor to British scientists about the effect of radiation was Dr. Carl Morgan. He is now to be found living in retirement in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Morgan was America's first practitioner of health physics, the science of determining the consequences of radiation on human beings. He confirms that the military planners knew then that radiation caused cancer, but in those days they were obsessed with finding out what would happen to the men first. They were primarily concerned about the radiation syndrome, how many would have excruciating pain from the ulcers on their skin, how many would be blinded so they wouldn't be able to carry out the rest of an operation? How many would be nauseated and vomit? And uh, how many would uh, uh, lose their hair and uh, would uh, suffer other uh, serious consequences? Those were the principal things that our military were concerned with. And in my discussions with many of my British friends that were related to the military there, I feel they shared the same views as our military here. At the same time, the head of the Royal Cancer Hospital in London wrote expressing grave concern to Sir John Cockcroft, the head of the atomic energy establishment at Harwell. One has in mind not the state of affairs of today, but what it may be in 50 years' time. Certain cases of leukemia in Japan are now being fairly confidently related to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosions. But the warning was ignored. 
Two years later, Carl Morgan repeated his warnings to Dr. Greg Marley, the man who set and enforced Britain's radiation safety levels. This same information was uh, uh, immediately available to Greg Marley and others who uh, consulted on a daily basis with members of your military. So I don't think there's any question but that there was uh, great uh, concern, trepidation, fear that uh, maybe they were uh, allowing ex exposures which would sometime later uh, cause serious consequences in cataracts and cancer and genetic damage to children. <laughs> Rushed out of Budapest in the last hours before the Russians took control. The Soviet Union's ability to invade and crush European states terrified the Americans. This goes some way towards explaining why nobody spoke out against the practice of endangering troops during nuclear tests. As the Cold War heated up, the pressures to keep your mouth shut and keep quiet about the health effects of radiation grew greater. A lot of people were were essentially told in the scientific establishment that it was uh, unpatriotic and somewhat treasonous to even publicly indicate that uh, large numbers of people may be put at risk as a result of these activities, when in terms of their internal debates, they were openly discussing what this meant. By 1954, British scientists had received the results of the first American tests. The Defense Secretary, Harold Macmillan, relayed to the Cabinet the devastating effects on Britain of an H-bomb explosion. He wrote that in an area the size of Middlesex, all life will be extinguished. For 3,000 square miles, exposure on the first day might easily be fatal. But even with this information, the British government pressed on. A command organization was set up at home in England. Air Vice Marshal Ulton was appointed Task Force Commander of the operation. Gentlemen, you've been dragged from your previous appointments at very short notice to form the planning staff for Operation Grapple. The government had made a decision many years before in its very secret committee uh, that Britain had to be a nuclear power or otherwise we were right out of world politics. And that was not to be tolerated for a moment. But Air Vice Marshal Alton's operation was immediately thrust into conflict. The campaign for nuclear disarmament was at its height spurred on by the success of political pressure abroad. The work had been going on fairly slowly, and then suddenly it was realized that a ban on, an international ban on testing of uh, such weapons was about to come into force in perhaps a year's time, and we would be left outside. So Britain would immediately become a second-rate power. Uh, in no way were we ready to do a test in a year's time, so there was indeed a sort of panic to get the thing rolling in time to get the test on first. The panic admitted to by the task force commander gives the lie to government assurances that the grapple tests were very carefully prepared. Britain's nuclear designer, Sir William Penny, never intended to explode the bombs at Christmas Island. He insisted they be dropped 400 miles away on deserted Malden Island for safety. From Sir William Penny's own calculations, they could see the mathematical basis for it and the technical way in which it could be produced. But he had no idea of the scale of the result. And as he said to me when I first saw him, he didn't really know whether his sums would result in just a, a small firework or whether it might be an immense yield. The, the uh, gap there was tremendous. Good luck. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Five, four, three, two, one. This confirms that the grapple tests were literally firing into the dark. The first three bombs at Malden Island were just not as powerful as the scientists had predicted. That started a chain of unexpected events which brought thousands of British servicemen into direct contact with nuclear explosions. Prepare much more powerful bombs. To Wilfred Ulton, it came as a total surprise. And we went for a walk along the, the uh, foreshore, knocking back a gin and tonic. And he said, I'm sorry to have to tell you, Wolf, we've got it all over again. That was the first inkling I had of it. I said, how soon? He said, as soon as possible. And I said, how soon is possible? He said, well, certainly not more than three months. 
And that was a tremendous shock to me because we were completely exhausted, both uh, manpower-wise and equipment-wise. And effectively, to do the whole thing over again would have meant another 18 months, which we didn't have. And so I thought, well, we can't use Malden again. Uh, we could perhaps do it at Christmas Island. So after 10 minutes thought, I said to Bill, uh, it's 30 miles from here to the point of the island. I think we could do it here. All the information we had at that date showed that 30 miles would be OK. You can't, couldn't say that anything was 100% sure, but it seemed a very reasonable proposition. The best area is there. But it was perhaps inevitable that such a rushed operation, even based on a reasonable proposition, would go wrong. And on April 28, 1958, during the second Christmas Island test, codenamed Grapple Y, it did. Weapon release. Weapon release. The only public information about it is a bland report produced by one of the observers who had never previously witnessed a nuclear test. It was learned that this was a clean bomb. It was not anticipated that any fallout from this bomb would occur. But not according to the men who were there. Close eyes. Close eyes. This is the exact spot I stood when I watched my first nuclear bomb test in 1958. Uh, I stood here with a white cotton suit and of course with a, with a hat. Uh, that was my protection to witness a, a hydrogen bomb. We were faced away from the bomb test area. We were also told to keep our eyes covered with our hands. Then all of a sudden, there was a fantastic heat. And the light, searing light and heat, hit us almost simultaneously. It was such a shock because I could see the complete bone structure through my hands, even with my hands over my eyes and my eyes closed. And then the next order was to turn around and watch the bomb. It was like a thousand horses coming towards you, the noise and the blast. All of a sudden, it was a tremendous blast. And we started to see it developing from a a hideous mass of various colours, as if it was burning inside, and it started to grow and grow, and I actually thought it was going to fall on top of us, the way it was, the way it was coming in. My God, what the hell's going on? We were all quite speechless, actually. You know, uh, you were amazed, you were frightened. All sorts of emotions came out. Quite frightened. It, uh, as I'm a young man, I was only 24 years of age then. I just got married. We all started panicking when we saw this cloud building into a, a massive ink blob. When the shortwave hit us, it knocked a lot of people backwards. And I actually saw the palm trees bending. And my bulldozer was only about 30, 40 feet away from me. And I was saying, is it going to topple the bulldozer over too? The general opinion was that somebody had got the sun wrong. And the bomb was a lot bigger than had been anticipated. Certainly, the furniture in, in our living accommodation was thrown around all over the place. Now, had, had that been anticipated, obviously we would have been told to tie it down or something. That explosion at eight to nine megatons in size was Britain's largest ever. The Ministry of Defense has always blocked any request for information. No details can be given of any specific explosion. It may be of use to an enemy. Any details that have emerged have been wrong. Officially, the bomb was released five miles from the coast. It was actually a mile and a half away. And an airman watching from an RAF Shackleton says it didn't explode at the official 8,000 feet, but much lower. We were flying, I think, about 1,000 feet, about 60 miles south of the island. And we, I think, closed our eyes for 10, 15 seconds then were allowed to look at the explosion. If it had gone off at 8,000 feet, it would have been well above the horizon. I, I saw a ball to start with. It hadn't started to form the mushroom. And uh, if it had gone off at 8,000, it would have been looking up at it, not uh, looking at the horizon at it. So the bottom three, 400 feet of the ball was missing. It was actually down on the ground. as Glenn Stewart describes, in spite of the safety devices built in. The bomb door is open. The weapon is falling. 
As the plane flew over the coast heading south, away from the island, the weapon was released and the Valiant immediately turned away. But the bombs were dropping at a thousand feet per second, out of any direct control. The explosion was triggered by an atmospheric pressure device which was by no means sophisticated. Effectively, all company hated devices, and that's what they are. They're very small devices, and I can show you one here. This is a, a diaphragm that's taken out of a carburetor. The atmospheric pressure works on the outside, say, through this tube, and then it charges against the standard reference pressure. So if there's a change of pressure, the diaphragm collapses. That could move, for example, a pin or a trigger device that sets the sequence up. In a nuclear weapon, for example, that would more likely start the detonation sequence of the conventional explosives around the fissile core. Now, simply a small piece of sand or grit or a small malfunction of this device could delay the detonation sequence occurring by several thousand feet. At this height, it's very critical whether the people would be exposed to a large dose of radiation or not. Uh, for eight or nine megatons, uh, I should say that the critical height is somewhere about 6,000 feet. If it was, however, below 6,000 feet, then the chances are there could have been ground burst and there would have been a, a large amount of fallout. If you expected a high altitude weapon to explode, then you position your men and equipment and monitoring stations at certain localities. Completely different for a low altitude explosion. If, by some malfunction, there was a low altitude explosion, then you'd be caught with your pants down, effectively men in the wrong place, equipment in the wrong place. Evidence to show that happened comes from this official photograph, only now identified publicly as the Grapple Y explosion. Looking at some of the photographs of Grapple Y, it certainly seems to have some peculiar characteristics that don't follow the normal pattern of a high altitude test explosion. Let's first of all look at a, a high altitude uh, thermonuclear device explosion. You can see it's a clear mushroom, very slow development, quite a distinctive hazy plume. If you look at grapple Y, this is very interesting. First of all, the most interesting thing is this styration effect of the plume itself. This fringe in and also the fringe in under here. Well, this suggests that a lot of heavy material has been pulled up with the plume. In other words, it sucked up a lot of sand and seawater at the initial explosion. That suggests it was a very low explosion for detonation. The critical importance of that is that any material sucked up would become heavily radioactive it would not be a danger as long as the winds blew it away. But dispatchers has discovered that it fell back onto the island very quickly indeed. Before they actually dropped the bomb, the sky was clear, you know. And once the bomb had gone off, other clouds, they seemed to come from nowhere. Very quickly after it uh, exploded, there was triggered off a line of cumulonimbus in a direction east and a direction west from the uh, point of explosion. This black cloud seemed to be coming towards us. It's only heading for the port area. The rest of the island, it didn't touch it. And as it came, you could see the panic of the, the personnel. After the explosion, the clouds, rain clouds may appear. They pass through the mushroom clouds, the nuclear clouds, and they have to pick up the scavenge, the particles, from the cloud and then they come down over precipitation. But even if there's no cloud at all, initially, in fact, usually the tests are carried out under conditions of a blue sky, nevertheless, rain clouds may be produced by the, the explosion. In the air, Glenn Stewart was the first to find out the danger the rain held. The dear old Shackleton leaked like a sieve. There was a escape hatch above each pilot's head and uh, the rain came through in a spray and I would imagine that uh, from those two hatches and the hatches elsewhere in the aeroplane that everyone in the aeroplane was exposed to this spray. The captain had a little film badge it was to detect radioactivity and that indicator had turned immediately to say that we had experienced radiation. Further evidence that the rain was radioactive came from the treatment given to Stewart's plane. The scientists ran the Geiger counters over it and obviously got the load clicking. And for the next two, two and a half weeks, the airmen were out there with the scrubbing brushes in the water. Uh, 
dressed in shorts and bare feet and scrubbing at the aeroplane to try and get the radioactivity down. This is not actually denied. Instead, the Ministry of Defence told us, We can find no records of rainfall or of the Shackleton being decontaminated. Either the people we've spoken to are lying or the MOD records are not complete. But on Christmas Island, Ken McGinley clearly remembers being caught in a sudden downpour of heavy rain as he walked back down this road after the test explosion. It was quite torrential, and when I walked back down to my tent, it was still raining. So I would say it was on for at least 15 minutes. Well, it was a real heavy downpour, and in fact, it put you in mind of hailstones, but instead of being ice, it was big droplets of water. They dispersed us and told us to take cover. Some managed to get on the shelter, but there was a few of us who didn't quite make it. By the time we got back, we were really soaked. There was two to three uh, scientists in the, the white coat, coats, and you, you could actually see the panic on the eyes of the rain black belt coming towards us. The scientists had realised what danger the rain held, but men on Christmas Island and the New Zealand Navy personnel on ships just off the coast did not know that they were being soaked by rain that was radioactive. Once the rain eased off, the day's work quickly went on as normal. It immediately got very hot uh, when it stopped raining, and I walked onto the bulldozer and started to clean it off with my hands, all the water which was on the, the long synthetic leather seat, and that was me all ready to go back to work again. Within three days of the bomb test, uh, I woke up one morning and uh, discovered I couldn't open my eyes properly. And uh, I felt quite frightened. I went to look in the mirror. Uh, my face, arms, part of my front of my body here, all my neck was completely covered in sort of watertight blisters. And when I felt them, they weren't sore. They weren't itchy or anything. But as soon as I went out to the, the sunlight, it really brought it on. It started to itch and it started to scratch and immediately reported sick up to the hospital. It left me very, very badly scarred uh, for life, in fact. Ken McGinley had the classic symptoms of external beta burn radiation, but the real damage occurs if it gets inside. There is evidence this happened, and the crucial flaw in the government's case is that they kept no individual records. We did not keep specific records of radiation levels for security reasons. We have terse comments indicating that radiation levels were very low. But no measurements were made of beta radiation taken internally by using contaminated washing or drinking water or breathing contaminated air. And yet this is the most damaging form of radiation for the New Zealand Navy personnel. They were at risk because they spent their time both on the island and out at sea. The New Zealand frigates were now spending 70% of their time at sea. Their modified and stabilized naval radars tracking balloons up to 120,000 feet. In those particular conditions that existed at Christmas Island, the very large factor could have been internal exposure, namely from, from the water, because the, the rain will come down into the water. And there, of course, it will stay for some time and it will be radioactive. And this could reach people in a variety of ways. For example, if they use the water for washing, and I believe that because of shortage of fresh water, they probably use it in this way. If they swim in the water, usually people take a bit certain amount of water in, and this comes in, into the body itself. On a coral island, for example, if a man cuts himself on the sharp coral, that could be a way of actually getting fission product, radioactive material, into his bloodstream. Just simply stamping around, playing volleyball or football on the ground, but resuspend any contaminants, put that back in. Eating local seafood could be a means of actually putting in concentrated loads into the body. For three, four hundred yards you could walk, and it was only up to your waist, the, the water, the clear blue water, and you could catch crayfish, lobster, all the, all the sort of delicacies, and we used to cook them right on the shore. We had a um, fish and chip business going four evenings a week at the port camp. There was 800 personnel, and I think we used to sell somewhere about 200 portions per night. For weeks afterwards, fish were taken from the sea in various parts of the Pacific and measured for any increase in the normal level of radioactivity. According to the Ministry of Defence, 
the radiation levels found in the fish each day were minimal. But according to one of the officers, this doesn't square with what a scientist in charge of measuring radiation found. On the night of an officer's party, he measured fish caught from the south of the island. He never recorded any radioactivity from the north end of the island. But this night at the party, he made a big scene of going out to do his background count. And we invited him to bring his Geiger counter into the, this new ground water room which he did, and it went berserk. It had never got a squeak out of it for the previous eight to nine months. And it was ascertained that the crayfish we had caught were radioactive. The fish were caught here, off the southeast point of the island, a mile and a half from where Britain's biggest ever nuclear bomb was exploded. Ken McGinley confirms that despite Ministry of Defence claims that safety was the first priority, soldiers were able to return to the blast site within days. I was back up here within a few days. Um, there was no restriction. Nobody told you not to go in. Nobody told you not to fish. You were allowed to come about here at will. Five, four... On my four days off duty, I used to go for walks and swims in the lagoons. And I used to walk through the, the area where the, the balloon hoist, the kiloton uh, range bombs were detonated. And there was no signs telling me to keep out. Uh, danger signs, radioactive signs. All I wore was a swimming suit and the knife strapped around the waist and a pair of flip-flops. When we put the fear of radioactive contamination to the Ministry of Defence, they told us... The records we have show the men did not receive dangerous doses. But that is the greatest weakness in the British Ministry of Defence case, because they measured only gamma radiation, which came from the bomb blasts. The other form of radiation, from beta particles suspended in the fallout and causing longer-term exposure, was not measured. The beta could have been predominant in this fallout, and yet the... Uh, meters which measured only gamma radiation might have shown nothing at all. Carl Morgan was a lone voice warning of the dangers of beta radiation. What he found suggests that the New Zealand Navy personnel on ships were in the greatest danger. Years before the British tests, when uh, we were testing the weapons at Bikini, uh, Dr. Stafford Warren, Colonel St Warren, was in charge of the health effects there. And there again, uh, our military did not measure the beta dose. And so I insisted on uh, making measurements. Finally, I was uh, loaned a group of servicemen. We went out in the small boats, boarded the target ships, and went to the islands and other places. And we found, that on the average, the beta dose was about five times the gamma dose. And on some materials, like br rust and paint and uh, uh, so on, the beta dose was as much as 600 times the gamma dose. So if, uh, if our instruments, our film badges, were only measuring the gamma dose, that was all that went on the record, it could be that this poor guy received 600 times this dose of beta radiation. If the servicemen did, receive high doses, and that's not just external doses, that's internal doses which they carry around with them for the rest of their lives, then the damage has been done now. Looking at the particles that might be rained out, just one of these particles could contain, could contain enough strontium or cesium-137 or plutonium to be the source of a malignancy that would show up maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 years later. From that one test on April the 28th, 1958, the pilot who dropped the bomb, Bill Bates, is dead from leukemia. The official observer who spent only eight hours on the island, Dennis Moore, is dead from multiple myeloma. In May 1990, the Community Health Department at Wellington School of Medicine in New Zealand published an exhaustive study into the health of the New Zealand personnel who had taken part in the grapple tests. By following up 528 men present at the tests, they found five and a half times the expected rate of leukemia. 
Their conclusion, some leukemias and possibly some other hematological cancers may have resulted from participation in this program. This confirms a previous study carried out in Britain by the National Radiological Protection Board into a much larger sample of British servicemen two years previously. Well, the NRPB report, in fact, found a statistically significant difference for leukemia and multiple myeloma between the test participants and their comparison group, their control group. In the, in the participants, there were 28 deaths from leukemia and multiple myeloma, whereas in the comparison group, there were only six, and this was a, a very significant finding. But it's the New Zealand findings which prove that the earlier British results cannot be dismissed as a fluke. In the New Zealand study, which was a, a much smaller study, they found a similar finding for leukaemia, in fact not for multiple myeloma, but that's a much rarer cause of death. So this was important evidence that the original finding had been replicated, had been repeated in another study, which gives you much more confidence that you are looking at a real effect. In fact, the New Zealand study showed slightly more leukemias amongst nuclear test veterans than the British one had. And remarkably, that is matched by a completely independent list kept by Ken McGinley at home in Scotland, where he runs the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association. How much you know? I've got the file on Mr. Patterson now. Um, so in connection with cancer, we would like to know specifically... Ken's list is for men who were at Christmas Island only. The inescapable conclusion is that those at the Christmas Island tests received more radioactivity than those at other tests. But Ken has found it impossible to prove. He can't check his findings against official readings of radiation levels where the men were because none were kept. There is evidence from America that could prove decisive for the British servicemen. American veterans attacked their government on the point that no specific measurements for individual radiation were taken at the time. Like the British, they kept only terse comments. When the fight was taken to Washington, their American lawyer fought their case and won. We were able to show that what the Defense Department was saying to Congress, that is, that these tests were safe, was simply not true. That if you looked at the documents, nobody could say with any certainty, the atomic veterans had not been placed in a dangerous situation. And at that point, Congress, particularly the Veterans Committee, said, that's it. We're not going to, we're not going to force the veterans to, uh, you know, find and establish facts and information that simply doesn't exist. We're going to give them the, the benefit of the doubt on the business about exposure. All they're going to have to do is show that they were there. I have already said that arrangements in the United States are a matter for the United States, but the government cannot just ignore the evidence from the expert advisors in this field. That not only is there no such evidence available, but there is the clear conclusion that those who took part in the nuclear weapons test program did not suffer harm. Cause of death, multiple myeloma, death caused by a war service, exposure to radiation. The clear conclusion of the death certificate in Barbara Fazakali's hands is that her husband Walter died from radiation from a nuclear bomb test. It's a breakthrough, the first time in Britain that radiation in service has been admitted as a cause of death. The fact that the New Zealand servicemen, who were up to 200 kilometres from the actual blasts, show the same increase in leukaemia as men stationed on Christmas Island itself, points strongly to airborne radiation being the cause. In Australia, compensation is already being paid to servicemen contaminated by the ground blasts on the British range at Maralinga. Now the evidence is mounting that the so-called clean air bursts in the Pacific were anything but clean, and the price is now being paid in human illness and death. We have got a very, very strong case. Men from practically every point in this island who died from either leukaemia or multiple myeloma. So in each and every part of the island where these men were located, I believe they were in a dangerous position. The way it was carried out, all these men in this small island plus atomic and megaton bomb test equals a mass experiment. They used us. 
me, no doubt about it. There's not one vet that doesn't think so. He was ill, you see, for about five or six years, intermittently. And I think he thought a great deal about it in that time. And I think he came to the conclusion that in view of the very poor precautions that were taken, that there was some fault to be laid at the door of um, the organizers, the scientists and the um, medical people who allowed this to take place. I feel really angry and I feel sorry for all these widows, the children. Uh, I, I don't know what to say, so I'm so angry. Because one day they'll recognise what we went through. It's just so pitiful that it's taken so long for people to realise actually what happened on these locations in 1958.